I love the camera, really, and I love taking photographs. I would just like walk around the city and photograph, and you know, later on in life, for several years, I didn't go anywhere without a camera. I always had a camera with me. That it was that mode of you never know when you're gonna see something. And now I use my phone camera, of course, in that way. Things I'm noticing that I want to look at later. I mean, that's a, to me that's a big part of photographing. You know, I want to look at it later. So <laughs> it's just that now our later is like. Okay, maybe like uh, uh, a minute or a couple seconds or maybe an hour if you're not on social media for a while. But, you know, and then we're on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Currently working on a book called At Home and uh, thinking a lot about looking back on my career. Uh, the book was motivated by the purchase of this house that we're in which is a Greek Revival home built in 1839. No, excuse me, 1837. And I said 1839 because that's the year of the invention of photography. And we know who built the house. It's Abel Grover. And so Abel heard about the invention of photography right here, right now, where we sit. So I love that because I've been a photographer my whole life. And, you know, before 1839, uh, no one had seen any, any images uh, of any relatives before that. So, I mean, we come from people, our people, but no one knows what they look like. And in the beginning, like, there's one picture of my great-grandmother because people just didn't photograph that much, you know. And there's more of my grandmother, you know, who I lived with, with, with us. She lived in the house with us. Uh, but not that many, you know. And then, so every generation, there's been more, basically, <laughs> in different ways to do it. Daguerreotypes were called the mirror with the memory because they had a reflective surface and, uh, and they were reverse also. Uh, and so the, the mirror part, that's the only way that people could see themselves. You know? So we, go, we have to go back to painting to understand who was depicted and who was worthy of being depicted. Uh, and so you know, we have religious painting and then we had aristocratic portraiture. And then we had like nothing for regular people. <laughs> so this is why photography was called, you know, democratic. Uh, I grew up in a very working class part of Utica, New York. All my own interest was about drawing from when I was very young. And then I liked multiples. So I went into printmaking and from printmaking, photography, doing both. Um, and uh, I went to a community college at first. No one in my family had, had uh, neither of my parents finished high school. It wasn't a required thing. I'm from a, a blue-collar, Italian-American, incredible family of uh, getting together and having celebrations and, and all the supportive things that one would want as a young person. Uh, uh, but, uh, however, we, we did have this tragedy in my life that, that set the stage for uh, my own um, kind of embracing of the art world, and the art world embracing me. So, uh, because my dad died unexpectedly uh, when he was away on a business trip when he was 37 years old, and I was 14. And so that set the course for my life because it was just a tragedy and so overwhelming for all of us. Um, and so that he died in March 27. That June, I took my first art course at the museum school in Utica. 
and I just felt better there, basically. Uh, I mean, it wasn't so much a rational decision like that, but that's where I wanted to be, you know, with kind of my people. And so I never left that whole situation. So in total, I taught for 40 years. I loved it. And uh, there's hard parts about the academic world, but I, I love the classroom parts. Teaching affected my photography very, very much, I'd say. I got, um, I got as interested in being a good teacher as I did about improving my own photographs. So you don't know what you're doing in the beginning when you teach. <laughs> and no one can help you, really. I mean, they can give you advice, but, you know, you're standing there and people are looking at you and they're... <laughs> um, so uh, it turned out it, it suited me very well. I'm a very private person uh, and not very you know, really outgoing in that way, or, uh, but I love creativity, and I like to help people. And the art world saved my life, basically, and I, I know how important that can be. fascinated by the creative process and of course if you make work for a long time you can see the threads of what you're doing you know as I'm 73 now and yeah I can go back and think wow like it makes sense you know <laughs> um, what I'm doing you know I have about three snapshots in the other room that I write about in my book here that I, I took when I was seven these cats were sitting on a fence post in the backyard and I looked out of our kitchen window and I saw them there and I grabbed my parents' brownie camera and I went out and I made like three or four photographs of, of these cats. I needed to get close enough, but I couldn't get all three if I got close, so I did two. And then I did the one that was over by itself a little further down on the fence. Like I uh, was speaking earlier, I took to the camera, I understood it. You know, I liked the framing. I liked that it was, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to put that into words, but I, I knew it was gonna be flat, you know. You know, and then specifically with our eyes, I mean, one of the reasons people make bad photographs and the cliche is, you know, you have a tree coming out of somebody's head is because they can't see everything because they're looking at their loved one and not the tree growing out of their head, you know. Well, it's the same kind of thing in the sense where I'm looking at these spatial concerns that I find, like, so fascinating. Apparently, looking through the viewfinder and imagining that flat, which a lot of people don't have that from 3D to 2D. Uh, it, it made sense to me, it always made sense to me that this was gonna be a flat thing. <laughs> and uh, so I've used that a lot in my own work to uh, you know, expand on the creativity of what a photograph is and can be. that I made in the 80s that would be very simple now in Photoshop. Mm. But I literally had two photographs in, in my studio walking around the West End, medium format camera, black and white. And I photographed, this was before Portland was completely redone, so there was a sort of a dilapidated house on Carlton Street. 
And then I went on another day photographing, and I just happened to, you know, I, I, was, I think I was making like 11 by 14s of these, and I, I tacked, tacked that up on the wall, these two. And then I looked at them with some other ones, and I looked at those two, and I thought, oh, that's the same building, different day, bright light, and then cloudy. And I thought, they look like they could go together, like fit together. And so I grabbed a piece of cardboard, threw it on the floor, because this is an apartment. And I, <laughs> anyway, and I, I literally cut the two photographs. So uh, one of the things that helped me is that I just do things. I don't think too much about it. If I get the idea, I do it. Uh, work that I'm doing now from a series called Parallax. These are color uh, images. Uh, are going to be displayed this summer at uh, the Maine Museum of Photographic Arts, run by a former student, in fact, Denise Froilock. I've had a lot of great shows and a lot of wonderful things that happened to me, but I was not really motivated in that way. And even now I sometimes have forced myself to have a show <laughs> and do things because it takes away you know, it's like having to get dressed up or something. I guess it's a calling, we could say. It's not a job. <laughs> but I, I think uh, if you can arrange your life when you're starting so you have enough time to make your work, um, and if you find community or help to make community, that's the biggest deal, I think, to keep going.